very bad um, odd um, actor the university um, ended up in hospital and um, he had four toes um, what do you call it um, removed <laughs> yeah um, so you will probably be driving a car to work from now on um, but um, he was really amped to be here um, and um, quite sad that he couldn't make it so um, yeah um, next time um, he's gonna do a presentation with me uh, but yeah it's me and Liam there's a weird bug on Ubuntu that the mouse pointer goes away, so I couldn't put his name in there, but it, it's supposed to be a... Anyways, um, okay, so all my opinions, um, there's a lot of them, are my own and whatever, and stop me at any point if I'm talking bullshit or whatever. Um, okay, some practical things. Um, come do a presentation if you're interested in security and you... Uh, come across something interesting um, um, like there's not much going on in South Africa in the community so um, yeah and uh, thanks for boss for helping everything sponsoring beer chips uh, I see there's even wine here um, and thanks to Chris Lou, and um, Liam um, Zero X coffee is on the 11th of June 2016 I really want to be there but I've, I'm gonna go to a camp um, this weekend but I'll try to be there. <laughs> I'm really going to the camp. But I'll try to be there in two weeks. Um, so I've got a call again. Ooh. Um, okay. Um, Can we just mention it's just a bunch of security people who drink. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's here. It's talk, talk, so it's not like. Half of the time it's not even about security. It's not just come and have fun. Yeah, it's here. It's coffee. just a bunch yeah. of. <laughs> security dudes in a in a bar and there's other people that have nothing to do with him there as well and it's a good networking opportunity if you like unhappy with your job and you're angry at your boss and you're like oh, for you i want to get a new job then um, go to zero x coffee you'll probably end up um meeting somebody who will say hey come work here and you know whatever um that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my success story um, okay um um, this presentation is about PCAP files. It's very random. Like, um, why did I decide to talk about PCAP files? I don't know. But um, I just um, thought, like, it sounds like such a boring thing. And you see, like, uh, like uh, I work with this uh, one guy. He's like this firewall guy, and he just runs DCP dump all day. And uh, like, you know, what is the point? Um, and um, like, sometimes if you do and stuff, people like, yeah, it's just a big account, leave it lying around, but there's quite a lot of stuff in it, um, and I'll get into that. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm interested in programming as well, and uh, I like um, reading about um, software that parses files and, and takes interesting things out of them, and yeah, this is what it's about. Um, okay, so, um, piece of slide, is, it, is this your one? Oh, look at me. Oh, okay, okay, well, I didn't make this slide, but this is a PCAP file format. Um, this isn't on that site, but there is this um, one site that I will add to um, the slides. I can't remember the name now, but it's got all the file formats on it. Um, it's called Fork, Kami, or something like that. But it's got all the file formats that you can think of and um, interesting things about them on the, like the PDF file format, PE file format, or whatever. But, anyways, it was decided on at this time, and then the PCAP was born, and there we go. Um, so it has a structure, um, and um, if you see, like, back at that time, most of this was meant for um, IPv4, so a lot of the, um, like one of the tools that I'll be discussing is only IPv4 already, so we'll still get there. Um, and that's the next generation. Yeah, so yeah, this is an improvement on um, the normal PCAP format. And yeah, I'm sure all of you guys have worked with stuff like Wireshark and T-Shark. Um, yeah, and those of you that play around with um, Python have probably worked with Scapy. There's an interesting presentation, you can um, look it up. Um, it's from the Python um, ladies group in California, I think, where the lady did a presentation on um, anyone can uh, build a um, NSA warehouse or something like that. But just get him um, down to cool things you can do with um, Scapy. Um, okay. 
so I'm going to skip. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, link. Just to edit is just more on that um, file format. It's quite weird that um, people put specifications for file formats on GitHub, but it's actually becoming a thing. Um, Microsoft uh, recently put the, um, I think it's COF, um, C O F F um, format, um, the specification um, on GitHub, and they want people to um, add to it because it's not very well documented. Okay, yeah, it's one of my slides. Um, so um, uh, this is a really cool tool. Um, it's written in um, Python, and um, it's uh, the use for it is um, if you have a PK file to look for interesting things such as session IDs or um, interesting cookies or um, even um, username and passwords, and it will um, print out the combination like in a nice yellow color. Um, and um, also, how I got to this topic for presentation is uh, if you check on GitHub, there's a cool um, profile for CTF write ups. So any of you guys that want to get into penetration testing um, should check it out, it's really cool uh, because um, they have the weirdest um, CTF write-ups that you can think of and a lot of them are forensic challenges. Um, earlier some of the guys here were talking about ZFS and all of these file formats and there are some crazy forensic challenges where people like um, get like uh, corrupted files or corrupted um, uh, ZFS. Is volumes I can't even remember and then you have to recover it but read over that and that's how I got some of the ideas for this um, but yeah netcrits is quite cool um, I'm trying to um, and here I did a, a demo um, and the idea for the demo came from this um, CTF's uh, profile on github um, on the write-ups 2015 section and this was a um, challenge where you're supposed to um, get a username and a password out of a PCAP file. Um, so you can just use this tool to do it. If you don't want to code something from scratch, so this was a challenge. You're a member of a covert agency and you're spying on one of the intelligence targets. They uh, have managed to man in the middle one of the target employees and um, moni you're monitoring his HTTP traffic. Um, you have to correct, get the correct password for that. And that's a PCAP file. So um, just I want to show you guys quick. Um, this thing doesn't take that much um, resources. Um, that was me running it, and this is like the output. So um, here it shows um, a, a URL where there was a session ID in it, because um, it regards that as something important. And um, I don't know why this came in on the screenshot. But um, here you can see HTTP username, and there's a um, username, and there's your password. The password is password dash safe from NSA. Um, but yeah, it's uh, quite a cool tool that should try it. Okay, yeah. So, as you heard, Mika was indisposed, and the doctor said go home, so he did. Um, basically, I've just used the file format a lot, got the Linux background, so Unix background. Um, so it's a good way to tell if files are corrupt or not. It tells you that yes, it's this file type, it's clicked in the headers and it's identified it by the magic file type information. Um, obviously if you can open a packet analyzer, then it's probably in a good shape. Um, so we'll take a look at a corrupted PK file and how to recover one as well. Um, and maybe some old school tricks which are not really you know, forensic type. So, with the valid one first. So, if you have a look here, we use the file command, it actually identifies it as a TCP dump capture file. So, it knows the packet capture file, which is useful. Um, if you open something like Wireshark, it will open and then you can actually read. Well, you won't be able to read that. I, don't think I can read it either. But it's actually uh, a session of somebody doing some DNS lookups, Bing.com, etc., and probably their search results after that. Was, that was downloaded off the internet. I didn't go and capture anybody's anybody working here. So. <laughs> okay. We're going backwards or forwards? Yeah. Okay. So then you've got an example of a corrupted PCAP file. So if you say file on that one, then instead of saying, hey, it's a valid TCP dump for capture file, so many bytes, etc., it actually says, whoa, it's just data. So 
generally, when it doesn't know what to do, it says dot. So if you try that in Wireshark, now same analysis tool, then it's no, sorry, not a valid file, can't do anything with that. So clearly that's going to be a spoke in the bicycle. The stick is there to stop it turning. A um, bit of an old school trick to run strings on it. In this case, we can find out pretty quickly it's an FTP session. So FTP is pretty in the clear, so pretty simple as well. Somebody's manually typing get this file, etc. So kind of you can figure out what's going on here, referring to you know key dots of the file. But you know that's kind of as far as you're going to get using uh, strings. So how about we try and get hold of that key dots of file from the packet capture? So uh, there's a tool called Foremost. We should have bolted that. So if you run that against the, the file, then you actually get some output. That's just the uh, initial display. Basically, it extracts the file, it finds a zip file, so it creates a directory output that zip. And when we go there, we have a look. I don't know why that guy's name is everywhere. Um, so we unzip it, and we actually get a little text file in this case, and literally that's some group. So it's a pretty basic example. But we do, as long as the slide's in the right order have some more interesting bits. So yeah, the old school trick is it worked for like something simple like an FTP session, uh, but something more complicated, yeah, you don't want to be sitting there trying to run strings and read the output and put it together. So why don't we try and see what Wireshark can do. <coughs> so we've got a, another packet capture file here. This one is about, uh, it's a session, and somebody's actually pulled a zip file in little parts, as in they've got like they didn't actually get an order either, just to make life harder. So they grab like the middle bit and then the first bit, etc. Um, so when you have a look at here and you try and unzip this file when you extract it, then you get like, whoa, bad zip file, incorrupt, whatever, it's incomplete, which it is because it's just one chunk of it. So if we have a look in Wireshark, then you can see that I've highlighted or I marked these in black just to make it easier. They're actually saying uh, partial data. It's in an HTTP session, and that's basically the uh, zip file that the person was grabbing like one chunk at a time, which is cool, yeah? Uh, the biggest and foremost, why does it take the packet data and then concatenate them, something similar? So again, this one? Yeah, the foremost. So what does it actually do to the pickup file? Does it just take the packet data? Uh, it looks in the pickup file, yeah. and you can actually tell it various things, like look for a JPEG file or mm -hmm. look for this type of file, and it grabs it. But it doesn't know what to do with uh, a zip file that's been chucked into ch or chopped into little pieces, which is what's happened in this case. Okay. So it grabs the first bit and says, "Well, there we go." It doesn't know how to reassemble the file either. So it's a bit of a. It looks at things and finds them, but if it finds mm -hmm. the needle in the haystack, if the needle's been cut into six pieces and I don't know, jumbled around, it's like uh, I don't really know how to put this back together for you. So. Okay. But does it use the sequence of what it was captured as the default construction? So it doesn't use the sequence of what packets were captured as the sequence of what it's going to stitch it together with. No, it doesn't get that far. It literally gives you the first chunk. Oh, just the first chunk. Because it is the same file, right? right. So it's, it's different pieces of the same file. So it also looks for one file name. Gotcha. So this, I'm inferring this. I didn't go and look at the source code. Okay. Um, what we can do, though, is grab all the pieces using something like Wireshark. So, like I mentioned, it was in the HTTP session when they were getting those bits of the zip file you know, a little bit at a time. So you've got this nice little handy feature, and it's literally at the file menu, export um, HTTP, or export objects, in this case, HTTP. Sorry, um, yep. what, what kind of um, corruption do you have on the file that the um, file and uh, 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 workshop don't but you're actually still able to get the zip data out of the file? wondering if I've skipped a slide here. So I think I've put them in the uh, wrong way. Okay. <laughs> that, that would explain it. Um, let's have a look. Uh, <coughs> okay, now we've, we've, got, we've gone too far. Okay, a long story short, uh, the normal type of corruption is when you have a header corrupted. So the actual packet data is still there that you've been capturing, you know, the TCP IP packets. So if you were to corrupt uh, literally the file header in Wireshark, no, I'm not going to touch that. It's a bit finicky. Uh, there's a, I'm going to have to tell you guys, you have to believe me because I don't even have a slide to back me up. There's a utility called PCAP Fix. And pickup fix actually goes and you can say deep scan, it goes and looks through the pickup file and go like, okay, that looks like a frame and a header and whatever, and puts it together and actually give you the correct header on top. 
because the header often says like size, <coughs> how many uh, frames or how many packets you've captured. So, good question. There you go. Okay. So if we say export all of them, I say I mean all of them. You can see here it's like flag dot zip. So eight chunks there. So that's answering your question about why foremost is just hangs up. It's you know, grabs the first bit. And, you know, oh, I've got it. So, so we end up with these eight chunks. Is <coughs> there something that specifically analyzes PCAM from? Which one? Uh, yeah, to extract dark out of specifically. That's its primary. So, so it, it operates on PCAM from? Yeah, it doesn't operate on this image. Yeah, you can use it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you probably could, right? Yeah, it's not, not specific. Oh, okay. That's not a hard So, What's kind of interesting about here, uh, if you play with T-Shark on the same file, and you play with grep, and you have a look for HTTP requests, which is what this top string is doing here, you can actually get the ranges here. Um, if you go back to, well, like, let's read one of them. So if you notice, this one here, it just says 0 to 468. So that's, to me, that's the one that says the beginning, the first one, like, start at 0. Uh, and if you have 469, to me, that would be the second chunk. If somebody wants to disagree, then. That's an HTTP response. <coughs> um, or, or yeah, in fact, let me just have one. Let's go back a bit to. Can we see it in. Yeah. I don't know if we can read this. But you get partial content. And. No, I don't have it yet. Sorry. If you actually look and you click on one of these, you get more details down here. And you can actually see the range of the, that they're requesting. So they're actually saying, like, Give me this chunk of the file. Then, like, give me this chunk of the file. And it's the same file, right. and then they did it out of order to make life um, yeah. trickier. Yeah. Sorry, but uh, uh, I didn't think about this when I was making the slides with you. They were the answer, like in a in a let's say an actual case, and you have like um, um, the only evidence that you have is like corrupted files. Hmm. Um, you obviously have to run some tools on it to to make the files like in a valid format. So that, that is where it gets tricky, and that's where the lawyers get involved and they have a long argument. And the one guy's saying, like, well, you didn't substantially change like what the evidence says. You know, you like, you fix, some guy will make an analogy and say, oh, you fixed the ending system on the file cabinet. You didn't actually change the files in the file cabinet, therefore the files, you know, we just made it easier to find them. That would be the argument that I'd be making if I was trying to say that it's not tampering. And the other guy would be like, no, you've changed it, therefore you have tampered it. And that would be the, the counter argument. Literally uh, a legal debate. You're not uh, supposed to tamper with no, the Yeah? The general reviews never work on the original. Yeah, make a copy. Yeah. And because then everything is deducted from the original. Hmm. If you haven't changed the original, they can't say tampering. Yeah. They're free to follow your reasoning and try and do the same. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, you're correct. Um, if you do the forensics courses and things like that, because obviously the whole point of doing forensics is to give evidence which can be considered, uh, you know, reliable in court yeah. and. They talk a lot about write blockers and things like that. You don't actually want to make any changes. So if you get someone's hard drive, you get a physical device that you plug in, like an electronic device, and it basically disables the data pins, prevents you making any writes to it. Yeah. Um, you can do it on the cheap if you use something like DD and Linux, and then you can create uh, just an image of it. Uh, you can mount file systems write only, sorry, read only instead of with outright permissions. Um, who's going to take your word for it in a court of law is where it starts to get uh, tricky. If you really, yeah. Um, if you're really worried about the, these sort of things, like you're actually going to court on this, then they start doing things like filming what they're doing. And step one is we take it out of the uh, sealed evidence bag, with the chain of custody, and we take this out. And while in the video we do this and we plug in the right blocker to prove that you know at no stage was any uh, were any changes made to this you know, storage device which has got the files and the evidence. Sneaky to get the uh, forensic stuff in. Okay, um, so to figure out the order, I would just say, you know, if you save something, you get the file name. You save it again. Convention is, you know, brackets one, brackets two, da da da, three, four, blah. So just matching that up is the order in which they're written out. 
and then the order that they're requested in, we can then to sort by the left, we end up with this. One, five, six. And when you do that, well, just cat them together, make put the file back together, which is actually what cat is for, if anyone's ever wondered. Then you can uh, unzip the file and we actually get something out of it. In this case, uh, flag of PSD, which is a Photoshop in this example file, which looks very boring. Because somebody's trying to be sneakier and playing a bit here, decomposing the layers, you could bring the layers up. It's a multi layer image if you take a look at it. So somebody was sending a message, a little bit of steganography. Don't make me talk about steganography now. <laughs> that can be a separate talk. That can be a separate talk. Yes, if, that, if we have to have a talk. Um, just something I was thinking about randomly while I was trying to put some slides together. Uh, if you look at Nmap, it does host fingerprinting. If you don't know what the other side is, not every uh, server or machine will say, hey, I'm running Windows, whatever, or I'm running Solaris, this version, etc., which makes your life much easier than if you're trying to find vulnerabilities. Like, find the operating system, find the version, go look at whatever, one of these uh, advisory boards where they publish all the known vulnerabilities and then start trying, hey, look, guys, I didn't patch that one, and then you're in. So what they do is actually look at the TCP IP headers. So again, network captures. So the NMAP tool is actually sending uh, like SYN and ACK to the machine on the other side and getting the responses and ACK, etc. And looking at things like the timing and especially fingerprinting, just like it's a very good term that's in some ways related. And let's put a few references in where some of this came from. The manual pages are actually quite good for PCAP fix and file. So I said there was PCAP fix and yeah, I think that slide got dropped. Uh, so in that wire, the image tool to pull the file apart. The also, there's a lot of stuff on PCAP files. There's like PCAP split and PCAP this and PCAP that and crate and dump and concat and so have a look. I think that's yours. That um, example that you had where you um, you scan with all the files. Yeah. Um, that, um, is that the same basically as like between um, uh, each like yeah. each file to uh, that last file? Uh, yeah. Okay, so basically, just saying, take this chunk, first one, then put the second one on it, or like maybe like this, one, in this case, one, five, six, two, so literally concatenate them in the order that's specified, yeah. and then the result is put into new zip, dot zip, which is just the name I chose. Okay, and so the last one has to come first, the other way around? Um, I determined the order looking at the ranges, yeah, yeah and said, that one is one, so I said one, uh, five, etc. So literally, I looked at the byte ranges. If I'd taken this and sorted it by, you know, these numbers here, yeah, that is the order that I used to put that back together. Okay, so that's a chunk HTTP response. Yeah. Uh, that's for yeah, from the Wireshark or so the PCAP file uh, when we grab for the ranges. Yeah. So that's for each of those chunks. We had a look at that. Okay, so PCAP is the ranges for them. That's probably the, the that's, headers that's that they grabbed. Yeah, mm -hmm. the headers. Okay, so in this, the when I used the T shock bit here, this one here, on that's where I got the range from. Oh, okay, okay, so it's but it literally is like the, the request the from the client really? to the server yeah. saying, like, hey, I want this chunk of this file. You know, you, can, you don't have to request a whole file from the oh, server. Okay, cool. yeah, Especially so like Unix servers, one. they like to do things like uh, allow you to resume a download like halfway through so you yeah. can specify the range. So if you think about it, then you can also say, oh, I need this range. Then like, oh, actually, you know what, give me the first half. Mm. Or in this case, eight chunks, but that bird and that bird. And okay. Just make life harder for people coming afterwards to try and figure out what's actually happening. Oh, cool. Back to you. So I don't have that many slides left, um, so we might finish early. Um, so I borrowed a few slides from somebody else's slides. That's always a good idea. Um, <coughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, so there's this is, um, tool called um, Merlock. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but um, it was um, it's open source and it was made by AOL. Um, not a lot of because we don't live in the states, you guys might not know who they are. But anyway, <laughs> um, um, yeah, okay. Well, some of us don't know who um, AOL is, um, unfortunately. But um, um, the, this tool is really cool. I've never seen anything like it. Um, uh, who knows what Elasticsearch is? Okay, cool. Um, it takes PCAP files, it puts it in Elasticsearch, and then they made their own front end um, to display the output in, but you could also look at it in Kibana, for example. Um, what it is not, it's not an IDS, uh, there's no alerts, but you can um, plug in certain APIs into it. There's some passive DNS API, I think the open DNS API key you can plug into it, and then you can get certain Gen, uh, information around the information that you have in it, which is somewhat security related. So some security organizations use it for that. Um, <coughs> anyways, it's not slow because it makes use of Elasticsearch, um, and um, it is uh, not closed source and it's not expensive, um, except if you're running the servers in South Africa on escrows. Electricity, <laughs> <laughs> it's very expensive. <laughs> um, I um, Okay, so. Uh, why I use um, my log um, because um, yeah you can I don't know but I've never seen something <laughs> take really large PCAP files um, with very uh, little resources on a server and index it so quickly like I took a 5 gig um, a PCAP file this afternoon and I think I, I ran it in 5 minutes and, uh, no less than 5 minutes and it was on the server virtual server with like 4 gigs of RAM and 3 or whatever um, and one of the cool features is you can import PCAP files, but like from a directory. So you can tell it, here's a directory, just take all of them and index it. Um, and you'll see now what it looks like and stuff. Um, so um, it can actually capture as well. It um, doesn't just like uh, take the raw PCAP files. So for example, if you're running Moloch on an interface and you run in-wrap scans against it, you will see it in the uh, web interface. Um, and it use um, Elasticsearch as, this is a wrong word, data store, not database. Um, and then it has a viewer at the front end that they're It's not that good looking, but it, it does a job. Um, okay. And just some more on what it, um, it has an API as well, so you can interface with it. Um, uh, we're basically as well, and um, it makes use of Node.js on different um, levels. Um, so this is an architecture, but this is a, a very simple architecture. So um, here's a person on the um, computer. Um, there's a um, capture or, or, or with the viewer, so the web interface. Um, and here you've got a bunch of PCAP files. Maybe it's in a directory on the server. Um, here you maybe have a switch um, doing um, like port mirroring, and you've got a bunch of computers connected to it, and that data is mirrored to um, the machine running Moloch. Um, so let's say, for example, um, something I want to do at home, I want to buy a bunch of old Android phones and um, install um, malware on them and then have a switch and have them all connected on their own Wi-Fi section and then do port mirroring and send it to Moloch and then look at that. Um, that's something you could do. And then what is that? I don't know. Oh, there's Elasticsearch. So, um, they just showed here as that because you could run Elasticsearch on a separate um, server, for example, and it just connects to that. Um, Elasticsearch um, uses a cluster kind of architecture where a cluster with one node is still a cluster. Um, okay, so this is an architecture of multiple nodes. Um, so it's a cluster with more than one node. Um, and th that's a cool thing. Uh, Malloc can really scale, like really, really scale. Um, and he has like multiple <coughs> switches um, running, um, um, and yeah, multiple captures, but all sending it to um, one um, Elasticsearch cluster. Um, so in, we'll be able to view the results in one viewer. Um, oh, and the cool thing is in, in the web interface, you can actually see from which capture it comes. So let's say you're like running eight of them, um, and, uh, and all of them on different switches then you'll be able to see where the data came from, if you were wondering. Um, okay, so the slides from here on are mine, just so you know. Um, if, 
I think it's fine, but anyway, it's really not that hard, like, you know, just <laughs> do it, like, I had, made, I had two slides last night, um, and a lot of pictures, and a lot of motivation, and um, my friend was in hospital, and I'm like, oh, I have to do this, uh, yeah, yeah, but anyway, um, this is quite a good article on it, I'll put the slides online, and go read it, um, and it's from 2013, actually, um, so, when you have, like, this cool new thing, and you want to play uh, around with it, um, you need test data, and um, finding PCAP files is not that hard. Like you can go on Google and look for some site and then just um, put um, e extension PCAP or whatever. Or well, this site has quite a good list of publicly available um, PCAP files and a lot of them are actual uh, PCAP files of uh, malicious traffic, botnet traffic, etc. So it's quite interesting data to look at. Um, uh, that one up there has uh, one, of the, uh, one of the files I think was like 5 gigs large. Yeah, this one here uh, is 5 gigs, but okay, it was compressed, so it's 800 megs. Um, so um, th this is how I like to um, use it, but you can do whatever. Um, my look, like let's say I installed it this afternoon on a server, it's running somewhere in America, so then. Um, Elasticsearch search and everything is only running on localhost, but I want to access it on my own browser. So um, you just use like local forwarding SSH, and then localhost port um, 8005 then becomes localhost 8005 on my computer. So um, on the server in America, localhost 8005 is if I type it in on my browser, it works. So um, does it make sense? Yep, it's search port forwarding. Um, um, this part disappeared, but the <laughs> this map like becomes larger and stuff, and th there's nothing in here now. But this is a server running in America, but localized 8005, whatever. And I think my lock is the name of an owl or something. Um, so they like owls, so there's a lot of owls on the web interface. Um, this is what it looks like if you um, import a pickup file um, and um, yeah it's like the command and you can look later but for um, importing from a directory so I was just put the stuff in temp which is probably a bad practice and then you can also tag your pickups that you import so that if you view it then like let's say you uh, imported 10 different ones you can add a different tag for each one so like just to keep everything organized um, and there yeah, they I was importing that five gig um, file, and um, this is what it looked like. I um, wasn't using <coughs> much resources. Um, is that H top? Yeah, it's H top. Um, I, I get a, I, um, I get a lot of flack from my running coworker for using H top and not top. Um, <laughs> This is um, one of the um, components of the web interface. It has like a relationship kind of viewer. So this is very interesting. Um, this is quite a, a, a favorite in the um, mass surveillance industry um, to look at relationships um, between IPs, but also between people, not just um, like this. But OK, yeah, we're not talking about that. Um, this is a relationships between IPs, who they talking to, whatever, that's quite interesting. Um, and, um, you know. Are you saying this is like Multigo? Um, no. It's different. It's different. But it's pulling that out of the PK. Yeah. No, no, I'm just saying it's a, a, a Multigo style way of yeah, looking at graphing. Yeah, if you if you were to take like a PCAP on the network here, for example, you would see the internal addresses and who they're talking to, and that can be very interesting. Um, uh, that's one article. I think I should like to add the others. Um, I um, I read a book for O'Reilly on um, Elasticsearch, and then. Um, it was a short book and then the new version of Elasticsearch came out and the book was semi-outdated so it didn't get published but I released it for free <laughs> um, and I updated it so it's up pretty much up to date I by now um, if you want to read it, if you want to learn about Elasticsearch Moloch makes use of Elasticsearch but not of Logsash and Kibana um, 
whether you guys work in security or not, like take my advice, learn Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, play around with it. It's a bit of a learning curve, but there is a lot of benefit in using it. Even if you work in advertising, there is benefit in using it. Um, yeah. And that's it, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, just to go back to the model, is that it's still active for development? Yeah. So um, it's on GitHub and they update it regularly. So um, this version, um, I was under the impression you have to use the old version of Elasticsearch, but um, it works with the latest version, which is awesome. Um, and um, yeah, it, it looks like it's um, maintained like very well. Um, yeah, and um, I didn't uh, show all the features now, and I don't have access to the server, otherwise I would want to show you guys. But you can do really cool stuff, like you can, in Malak, you can look for, uh, uh, let's say, um, I think, references to email addresses, for example, and export that to CSV. Um, I can't remember what up, but you can, um, you, you can see a map of geographically where people are connecting to and from. Um, it's quite amazing. And like, um, if you have um, laid servers at home that you want to play around with and you don't know what to do with them, get like a really, really, really big pickup files and set up Moloch in a cluster and import them and you will have a lot of fun. Okay, cool, that's it. I said my laptop via here, so here the tunnel can do not turn to it. I can do my keys, I need to see where the ISS are. Yeah, sorry. Okay, quick one little thing. Sorry. Just going through that a little bit quick earlier. Once you put out that in that references section, that one. This is a great resource to go and look at the capture the flag. So when they give you a challenge to do, and then they actually explain on how to do it. So yes, I didn't know all those things until whenever I started having a look there and figuring so it out. So again, yes, last last night. Yes, last, last night. <coughs> last night. Um, hey, I, I phoned Mika and at least he was alive, right? But he definitely confirmed he was not coming here. So so yeah, that one blue. Yeah, it, it, like um, if you ever. Like don't have something to do at work, <laughs> which I doubt happens in this economy. But if you ever bored like for five minutes, just go. And, uh, this is a 2015 write-up, but there's um, 2016 write-ups as well. And you'll see some uh, some challenges <coughs> not documented very well, but um, some of them are. And each uh, challenge with the write-up has links to blogs. And I'm always looking for new blogs to read about <coughs> security-related stuff. And this is a great resource for that. And some of the challenges are really difficult, like like exploiting shell shock blindly, and then routing so weird, weird stuff like that. Some of it's like forensic challenges. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And if you're too lazy to read uh, on Twitch, you find what was it? I can't remember who did it, but uh, yeah, Geoards. Yeah, the George. interactive. Um, you know, so you reverse engineering challenges. No. Sweet. So you can actually watch four different terminals open on four different uh, laptops, guys going against the clock, reverse engineering or uh, hacking a, a little web box. So that's also a good way. Then another thing, although maybe a little controversial, is the guy who hacked Hack Team and uh, Gamma also put out a video of how he hacked some was it Spanish, Spanish, Spanish police, police uh, forum. So these Spanish police were beating up people, and people losing eyes and stuff, and while they were out pepper spraying people, he made a video of him getting into their WordPress and pulling everything yeah, off. Was it was WordPress. Yeah, there's anything else. Oh, okay. But I'm uh, um, like, yeah, whether you agree with the political methods of the, the video or not, um, the technical side is really um, interesting. And he um, brought up quite a few techniques. We'll put links on the mailing list of all the stuff we uh, mentioned. Yeah. Cool. Questions or drinks?